Some of the main things I see deconstructionists complaining about is the time they gave to the church freely. I experienced so much emotional abuse. I worked for free. That tells me that you didn't want to be there. No, no, stop right there. Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome back to the YouTube channel. So someone actually tagged me on TikTok uh, underneath this video and I figured, wow, this is actually a great video to do a response to. So I figured we can go through it together. As you can see by the title, it has to do with deconstructed quote Christians. Before I go into it, I wanna say that I was doing some digging on this person. This comes from the account on TikTok, True Christian Ministry. I couldn't find a whole lot about this person, like his name or where he's from, but he does have a YouTube channel. And from what I can tell, um, it seems like his past was uh, involved addiction and crime. He actually has a YouTube video that says that, Jesus saved me from addiction and crime. So my guess, and I am kind of um, making some, some judgments here that I could be wrong on to be clear, is that he was living one lifestyle that was pretty extreme and then got converted to another extreme lifestyle of evangelical like fundamentalism kind of thinking now that being said i want to be clear i don't wish this person ill if this person is living a life that is healthy and is promoting human flourishing for him and he is happy and feels whole i wish him well on his journey we're not here to gatekeep uh who the true christians are or or, or, or what that means but whenever someone does a video on deconstructed uh christians or you know deconstruction in general i like to respond to it because it's important and my guess, I've only seen this video once, and from what I can tell in my first pass through, I don't think this person is too fond of people who are deconstructing. So let's get into it. As always, friends, thanks so much for being here. If you want to subscribe to the channel, that would be great. We are also on Instagram, TikTok, and the podcast channels, of course. So make sure you give us a listen or a follow on those socials. And with that being said, let's get into True Christian Ministries' thoughts on deconstructed, quote, Christians. Here we go. I am so tired of seeing these ex-Christians on here talking about how they deconstructed. You didn't deconstruct. All you did is finally get honest about who you really are. Wow. We're just coming out swinging. Okay. So the first premise is that if you're an ex-Christian, you probably never were a real Christian. You never really deconstructed. You were just honest about who you really are. Got it. So already now we're going to explain to other people their experience and just override whatever they say about themselves and about their experience because they, turns out, were never true Christians to begin with. Here's the truth of deconstructed Christians. You were right. either born into Christianity and told you were a Christian from childhood, so you thought you were one until the day came where you decided not to be one anymore. Or you came to Christianity later on, but you did not come for the gospel. Okay, so this guy gives us only two options. Either you were born into Christianity and never were a real Christian. You were just kind of thrust into it. Or you got saved later in life and you never came for the real gospel. Now, I'm not sure what, what his version of the real gospel is. Again, I don't know much about him. He sounds a little more reformed in his language so far. Reformed theology is more Calvinism or Calvinistic, if that's even a word. Think tulip theology, the idea that God um, has predestined people before the foundations of the world to be saved. Um, it involves the idea of total depravity, that we are born inherently wicked, etc. And whenever I hear people say things like the true gospel, in my experience, that's usually code for some type of reformed theological perspective. Now, we'll deal with that later on because we'll unpack what he means by that. But this first part, that you were just thrust into it and never really, I guess, owned your faith. You know, that could be an option for some people, but that's not the only option. A lot of us, and I am one of these people, were all in on the evangelical Jesus. We were all in. I did everything because I wanted to. Okay, I didn't feel forced to. I wanted to own my faith. I prayed the prayer. I walked the aisle. I believed in my heart that Jesus Christ was Lord. Um, and I wanted to save souls for Jesus from the depths of hell. Just because I've deconstructed some of my theology does not mean that somehow I was forced into it or, or that I was just going through the motions. I was as sincere as I knew how to be pretty much my entire life. In fact, the work that I do now is still out of my sincerity for wanting to follow Jesus, even though it looks very different. So this this is like a false option of either you were just kind of forced into it as a kid, 
or you never experienced the true gospel if you came to it later on in life because you've now deconstructed. Many people renegotiate their faith out of a love for Jesus or out of a love for the Christian faith and because they don't want to give up on what they believe, right? They want to find better paths forward. Of course, there are a lot of people who deconstruct and they leave the house of Christian thought and they're allowed to. People are allowed to leave, especially when you start listening to the voices of survivors, people who experience not just like my pastor was angry at me one day, but actual S.A., actual physical abuse. And then it was covered up by the church. And of course, if you follow any of the work that we do, friends, you know that we cover this stuff time and time again. So, so far, I reject this guy's premise that deconstructed Christians or ex-Christians uh, never really believed or never had the true gospel. You see, there's this thing that happens in our country where people are born into Christian homes and their parents don't actually teach them anything. They just say, you're a Christian. They make them go to Sunday school and they make them read the Bible. That might be a thing. Uh, I I live in the Northeast. That's not really a thing in the Northeast, but I my understanding of the South is that's very much a thing. So that could be a, a, a fair point. But again, to apply to all of ex-Christians or, or deconstructed Christianity, I don't think it's a fair assessment. These people don't actually know what the gospel is. They never actually came to Jesus on bended knee saying, Lord, I need you. Uh, I did. I did. And I also played drums in many of those worship nights uh, that caused people to bend the knee to Jesus. So again, I reject this man's premise that because I've deconstructed my faith and I'm no longer a reformed or conservative evangelical, that somehow I never actually became a committed Christian. I don't know how I don't know how many more accolades I can give someone to prove that out of my sincere love for Jesus and trust in his grace and forgiveness for my sins, I I did all of the things I was told to do as evidence of the faith inside of me. And they get older and they think I'm a Christian. I, I, I'm from a Christian home. I go to church. I'm a Christian. And then they face a moment where they have to make a decision between their sins or Christianity. A decision between the hmm. world and Christianity. Okay, um, I need to point out something really quick. Most people who deconstruct their faith and are allowed about it actually care about their faith or actually care about what happened to them. So this idea that like you were never sincere um, and now you're deconstructing isn't really the case because for you to be so concerned and so obsessed with the thought of, oh my God, what happened to me at church, I need to make an Instagram account or a TikTok account to talk about that, shows that you were actually super committed to what you believe. People who who usually are born into a home like this, right, where you're just kind of brought up in the culture, like this evangelical culture of Christianity, they just kind of walk away quietly. They just find a job and career and stop going to church. They don't make social media accounts to then broadcast the harm that happened to them and why they changed their belief system. Just keep that in mind. And just as Jesus says in the parable of the sower, some seeds land on rocky soil and do not take root, but they do sprout up immediately and they rejoice. They have joy. But the moment they face persecution on account of the word, they fall away. Okay. So this guy's talked a lot about, uh, again, very classic evangelical language of choosing the world over the true gospel or falling away once you face persecution. I, I'm not sure where he lives. I'm assuming America, like where I live. Christian persecution is not a thing in America. In fact, Christians are the most privileged group of people to exist. Um, they have their own industries. They have people who are advocating for them in Washington, writing laws that protect uh, more and more of the religious freedoms, even at the expense of other religious groups or non-religious groups. Uh, for example, I'll give you one quick example, friends. It is It was not uh, Muslims or atheists who were petitioning the Texas government to put the Ten Commandments in every single public school classroom. It was Christians. Now, thankfully, the bill was defeated, but the fact that they even got that far, I think, demonstrates the powerhouse that is Christianity. This idea that because you chose what he thinks is the world or culture, which, by the way, and I can't prove this, I'm just going to make an assumption here, tends to usually be code for um, you don't think that being gay is sinful or some other kind of like typical evangelical boundary. Maybe you were pro-life, now you're pro-choice. Uh, maybe you're more liberal leaning, and, and even though you grew up conservative. That tends to be what people like this are hinting at when they make statements like this. And again, in my experience, maybe he's thinking about something else. I don't know. But most likely, if I was a betting man, I would put a good chunk of money on 
Yeah, he's probably talking about Christians who don't think being gay is sinful anymore. The fact that he says it like this, I think just reinforces that that for him, anyone who has left his boundary of what a true Christian is, is either no longer a Christian or never believed in the first place. And then you got people that come to Christianity later on, and they might spend years in the church. They might even take a position in the church working there. And then the day comes where they say, you know what, this isn't for me. But the truth of the matter is, they never came for the gospel. Yeah, he keeps on saying this. And I, my, my question to him, if I was talking to him, I would say, well, how do you know someone saved then? Right? Like, is it only at the end of their life as long as they never, quote unquote, fell away? Uh, I was taught that that the way it works is you are saved by grace through faith, and then your good works demonstrate the fruit of what you believe. So if someone gets, quote unquote, saved later on in life, like, for example, this guy, right? This guy got saved later on in life, he's doing all this work. One day, if he ever decides, you know what? I think the expression of Christianity that I believed in maybe isn't as healthy as I thought. As I thought, Is he no longer a Christian? Is, is that how it works for him? Is everything that, that he's doing on social media completely gonna completely erased the second he changes any of his beliefs I, I i wouldn't see it that way but for him it's interesting just to see him talk about okay you did all these things you did what the church told you you also believed the right way but then because you changed your mind later on it turns out you actually never believed it i don't think that's really a fair assessment these people came for reasons like community or maybe they came because they wanted all the benefits of jesus Can, can I be honest with you guys? Yeah. If all you did is preach the benefits of Jesus, everybody in the world would love those. Peace, joy, love, paradise, heaven, eternal life. Those are some incredible benefits. Not many people would turn those down if only presented with them. But you see, these people don't actually believe in their heart. They don't actually believe Jesus is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Okay, so he talks about the benefits of Jesus, like the fruits of the Spirit, etc. is pretty much what he says here. But th then he says, well, if that was all it was, everyone would believe. Well, what else is it? What, is, is it the fact that, that, that you're an evil, depraved sinner worthy of hell? That's where some more of that, again, assuming I'm right here, some more of that Reformed theology kind of comes in, which, by the way, You don't have to accept Reformed theology to be a Christian. There are many streams of the Christian tradition that do not affirm total depravity as like a baseline. So again, we're kind of funneling, not even just to Christianity, but to his specific flavor of Christianity. He still hasn't explained what, what the true gospel is, at least in this video. So I'm kind of curious to know, like, what is it? What is the true gospel for him? They just want all those benefits so they convince themselves they believe so that they can take part in those benefits. And then again, something comes up where they have to choose the world or Jesus and they choose the world. Yeah. So, I mean, I wonder for him, you know, he says in a previous video that Jesus saved him from addiction and crime. Didn't he want those benefits? Didn't he want love, you know, peace, joy? etc. Um, I, I, I'm just not sure what he's getting at here, to be honest with you, friends. I don't understand what, what the problem is. A lot of people come to Christianity or other belief systems because they want healing. They want peace. They do want joy. They want to feel love. They want community. Those are all key parts, by the way, of the Christian life. There's countless books written on uh, life together by, by like DJ Bonhoeffer and stuff like that. And that's important. That, that's a part of the Christian way of living. So again, what is this gospel that is separate from all of that? I, I still don't know. Some of the main things I see deconstructionists complaining about is the time they gave to the church freely. I experienced so much emotional abuse. I worked for free. That tells me that you didn't want to be there. No, no, stop right there. Okay, this guy is out of his depth on this statement because what he doesn't either acknowledge or understand is that for a lot of people, and this person, this guy did not grow up in the church, so I understand that. At least for me, and I know for many of us out there, when you're taught that the way you love God is by serving the church freely, that creates a cycle where regardless of what you might think, you feel obligated because you want to please God. Now, that being said too, let me also say a lot of us, and this is the camp I'm in, I volunteered my time completely consensually. I loved doing it. I loved it. I loved drumming. I loved volunteering. I loved helping start churches. I loved leading small groups. I did that all for free. But a lot of people, what happens is, is that you think that you're part of a community. You think that you're part of something and that, and that you're a, a family, that, that you have, 
you know, people who will walk through the trenches with you. And then when you change some of your beliefs or when harm happens to you in that church and those people abandon you, you then start rethinking about, well, what, what was all of that for? Oh, the church wanted my labor to make the system continue. So like for, I'll use myself as an example here. I volunteered at my previous church for six years. I never complained once. I did it all consensually. My pastor had a limit how many times I could serve because he didn't want me to burn out. But I also thought that him and I and the people there, that we were all friends regardless of like if we had different beliefs on things. When I started changing some of my beliefs that, by the way, were still very much Christian, just not very fundamentalist, they gave me the ultimatum to either stop serving as a drummer with them or to stop doing the work I'm doing right now, talking into a camera. I left that church and all of those friendships evaporated besides like three of them. That pastor that I spent six years with talking to, you know, three times a week, helping to build the worship team up, he just evaporated. And so when that happens, you have to look back and think, well, wait a second. I thought th there was an agreement here. The agreement was that I'm volunteering, but we're doing it together and that we're friends. Once that friendship is erased, you're then left to think, well, then why, what was all of that for? And so a lot of people start renegotiating what that experience was and they realize, oh my God, I was only good to the church as long as I gave them my labor. But the second I was no longer useful to them or that my theology was too far from them, I was discarded and my humanity was discarded with it. That's the difference. So again, this guy has a very, I would argue, callous take, and he's clearly not listening to the stories of people and to the legitimate hurt that has come from people who have given their lives to institutions that threw them you know, overboard, essentially, and just kept on going because they no longer fit in with the status quo. You weren't giving it to the Lord. You were giving it to people. You didn't go to church for God. You went there for people. Yes, that's why you go to church. I mean, this was the argument. I'm not saying this guy believed this, but during COVID lockdowns, right? What was the evangelical church's big cry? We need to meet together. We can't just do it by ourselves. We're meant to do life together. So yes, you go to church to be in community with other people, worshiping God and loving your neighbor. To make it seem like there's a separation there. I mean, that's not biblical at all. That like the acts model that we see is them in a community, literally a commune, sharing all that they had in need. This idea of an individualistic relationship with Jesus, I guess is fine if you're in your prayer closet, but the reason why the church exists is because people come together. So yes, that, that's exactly one of the reasons why you go. Or for the events or for the groups. And because the world hates Jesus, you've realized when you speak against Christianity, your views go way up. Okay, let's stop right there. First off, this idea that the quote unquote world hates Jesus is ridiculous. The world hates Jesus. Christians who are jerks. When you have Christians who are fighting tooth and nail to minimize the rights of queer people, when you have Christians historically in America who fought like hell to maintain segregation because God demanded that the races stay separate, that's what the quote unquote world, including myself, by the way, and I'm, I'm a Christian, hates. It's not Jesus. I have yet to meet anyone who's like, man, that loving your enemies thing, you know, the meek will inherit the earth, the love your neighbor as yourself. I hate that Jesus. That Jesus is garbage. No, they don't like the Christians who weaponize the faith to then dictate and enforce laws on people that are not Christian. I mean, forget for a second. Let's put the current trans right debate aside that's happening in our moment right now. You can trace this back to when the Supreme Court ruled that gay marriage was illegal federally. Christians like this guy probably, and again, I don't, I don't want to assume, but people in this vein of thinking, I'll put it that way, were up in arms. They were up in arms that a, a pluralistic society could allow other people to get married to members of the same sex. That's what the world doesn't like. Do not tread on me, right? So this idea that, that the world hates Jesus, no, no, no. The world does not like when Christians weaponize their faith to try and control other people. I'll tell you right now, if Christians were the loudest voices for affordable health care in the country or for, you know, getting rid of the death penalty or for student forgiveness or for affordable housing, livable wages, I bet you the world would not hate Christians. But Christians, especially American ones, have like this weird persecution complex where they feel like if they're not being hated, they're doing something wrong for the world to say, wow, 
You guys did a great job. We're really proud of you for standing up for this marginalized community. That is to them what's offensive <laughs> because that means that like they weren't hated. So I just find this train of thought ridiculous. That's why so many atheists and ex-Christians dedicate their entire platform to talk about the God they don't believe in. You did no. not deconstruct. You just decided to finally be who you really are. Man, talk about gaslighting at the end. Right? I mean, and this is, and again, I'm someone who used to be like this in a lot of ways. Um, and I can say it, right? Like you make assumptions about people and you, what you do is you say, well, no, what you're telling me about yourself and your lived experience is not true. I'm telling you what is true. It's a complete supremacy complex. The idea that, that, that people who are deconstructing, their stories are not valid because you're just showing who you were all along. You were never sincere. You never really believed. It doesn't matter what you did. It's all nothing because you changed your mind now. So anyway, th these kinds of videos, I love responding to them because they need to be responded to. And again, I wish this person well. If he has found a really healthy way of living, I'm really happy for him. But there's no reason to now take your way of thinking and then assume that people who left that way of thinking were never believers in the first place. There are a lot of people, tons, who either are still Christian, even though they've renegotiated their faith, or they left the faith even though they sincerely believed. Thanks for watching. Make sure to like and subscribe. Talk to you all later on.